excited about God's word tonight. I'm going to teach on a precious topic of scripture to me that actually I have taught on in Memphis before. Um, so if some of this insight some of you have heard before, you know, get over it. <laughs> Maybe it's just me that's hard-headed, but every now and then the Lord just got to say something to me more than once for me to really take hold of it and do something with it. Lord Jesus, we are your daughters. We've worshiped you in spirit and in truth. We have rolled out the red carpet for you to come. And so, Father, I ask that you would come. Lord, rend the heavens and come down. Speak to your people because, Lord, we are so glad that each other is here, but we didn't come to see each other. We came to see you. And so, Father, I am asking that tonight, as we open up your word, you would speak to your daughters. There is someone here that needs a word. Somebody's marriage is hanging on by a thread tonight. I pray that you would salvage it tonight in Jesus' name. Lord, somebody needs healing in their physical body or their mind or their broken heart needs to be mended. I'm asking you to do it tonight in Jesus' name. Lord, somebody needs clarity, Father, for direction for this next phase of their life. They've been waiting on you to give them clarity. I ask that you give it to them tonight in Jesus' name. Lord, there's somebody that needs victory in some area where they're watching the enemy come in and run rampant in some area of their lives. So tonight, Lord, I'm asking you to give somebody a strategy, a battle strategy for victory. Lord, would you do it? We are your daughters, Lord. We came to hear from you. We don't want to go back home inspired tonight. Inspiration wears off, Father. We need to be changed. Transform us, Lord. We don't need another women's conference. We don't need to just hang out and have fun. We thank you for the fun, but Lord, what we need is a word from God. And so speak, Lord. Come on, somebody say, speak, Lord. We are your daughters. We are sitting on the edge of our seat to see what it is you will say to us. In Jesus' name, come on, everybody agreed and said amen. amen. So those boys that I mentioned to you, um, I think the reason God gave me children is for illustrations. Because <laughs> I keep... Finding illustrations in the life of my boys. I mentioned to you that they're all very engaged in sports. They play really whatever is in season, but my second son in particular really grew very attracted to baseball for several years there. He's laid it down now for basketball, has taken his passion, but, but baseball was really what he loved. For lots of years, we were in baseball season, and I enjoyed baseball season. Kind of miss it. I wish he was still playing it. I enjoyed it because spring ball is fun to me. In the evening, you sit out there with your kid, the bright light of the baseball uh, diamond there as you sit on the bleachers, the cool spring air brushing across your cheeks. You're enjoying just watching your kid play in the cool of the spring evening. I like spring ball. The only problem with spring ball is that it becomes summer ball. <laughs> and Memphis is just like Dallas, Texas where in the summer it does not just warm up slightly. You know, it's hot. Hot like where you feel like the sun must be mad at you. <laughs> you feel like you must have done something to the sun and the sun is trying to get you back all summer long. It's just piercing and blistering hot. And I have enjoyed watching my, my boy play, but I especially love it in the spring because when the summer rolls in, it's just that excruciating heat where really you're trying to be happy that your kid is doing well. And you're really okay when you're just out there for one game on a Saturday, but at the end of the season, they have a tournament. <laughs> so you're sitting out there trying to be happy for your kid because he's doing well, but, but you've got to go out there on Thursday at 8 a.m. and then at 10 a.m. and then you get a little lunch break, but then you gotta come back for the 2 p.m. game and the 4 p.m. game. Then depending upon how your kid's team did, they're gonna take your team, shift it to an entirely different bracket of teams because on Friday you have to come back 
for the 8 a.m. game and then the 10 a.m. game and you get a lunch break at noon but you're coming back for the 2 p.m. game and the 4 p.m. game and then if your kids team had the nerve to do well you got to come back on Saturday for the 8 a.m. game and the 10 a.m. game, and then you get lunch, but you're coming back with 2 p.m. and 4 p.m., and then forget Sunday's supposed to be dedicated to the Lord. You're coming back on Sunday to play those last round of games before they hand out the awards. And I got to tell you, my second son, probably partly because of his size, um, he's always been just a good player. He had a knack for baseball. And I remember at 10 years old was the first time he got a really good hit and sent the ball over the fence at 10 years old. He was great at first base, just had a knack. You know how certain kids have a knack for certain sports? Well, baseball was his, was his knack. He's had to work really hard for the other ones. Baseball came easy to JC, so we were proud of him. Of course, had a lot of maturing to do, but we enjoyed the tournaments because his team usually did well. And you're trying to be happy. But you're sitting out there sweating, and I'm not talking about those cute little glistening sweats. I'm talking about the kind where the sweat is rolling down your face and your neck and the inside of your shirt and your jeans. And you're trying to celebrate, but really you're wondering if it's ever okay to pray your kid loses so you can go home. Come on, can I get one witness in the house? And a couple of seasons ago, I remember we were out there during the summer. We're sitting underneath that outdoor tent we bought from the sporting goods store that that person promised us when we bought it that it would stave off some of the heat of the sun. But there we were sitting under the tent, sweating bullets, could not wait until lunchtime so we could go to a little nearby restaurant and just have air conditioned. That's what we were after. We sat down, had a little light lunch, got some water, ice water that actually still had ice in it for a little while. <laughs> Felt a little refreshed, and then we came back for the next game. We lifted up the back of the SUV and got all the gear out, the bats, the bags, the ice chest, the outdoor tent, all that stuff. We're walking over toward the baseball dugout that will be, uh, that is assigned to the next uh, field that we're going to play at. I'm following behind my second son. My second son is a very gregarious personality. He's ready for the next challenge. His shoulders are back. His chest is poked out. I remember his chin was up, and because I was right behind him carrying the bags, I could see that he had a skip in his step. He was ready for the next challenge. The closer we got to the field, though, the more I watched my son's countenance completely changed. I watched his head start to hang down. I mean, y'all, a short walk from the place where we parked to the dugout, but I watched that chin go down and I watched his shoulders slump over. I watched him start wringing his hands like he was nervous, and I watched his eyes get a little bit skittish like he was afraid. I'm trying to figure out what was happening because it was just a short w walk from point A to point B. I'm following behind him. I'm watching his countenance change. And as we were walking, I realized we were passing right by some other team members. They were from another team. I realized as I passed by them, this was the team we were about to play. These boys were sprawled out underneath the shade of a tree on some grass, and we were walking right by them. And so I was getting a look at all these, these players as we passed them. And the more and more I passed, the more I realized what was wrong with my boy, because I recognized these players. We had faced this team earlier in the season, and this was a team of serious baseball players. You know the kind of team that has the serious parents? <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for all that. These are the kind of parents where, you know, when they gave birth to their boy, they put a mitt on one hand, a baseball on the other. They've been waiting for this their whole lives, you know? And we had played this team earlier in the season. And when we had played these teams, they, they were good players. They'd been playing since they were toddlers. They were incredible players. And um, they had annihilated my son and his team earlier in the season. I remember it had been a complete embarrassment, a complete upset when we had played these boys before, and now this was the team they were about to play next. So my son walked by, and as he did, his countenance changed because he realized this was the challenge that was in front of him. So he walked right by him, and because we were so close, there were two players that leaned over to talk to each other. One of them leaned over to the other. He was whispering. I think he thought he was whispering, but we could hear him. He said, there goes the big kid from the Red Sox team. Is he the one that hit the ball over the fence? 
Yep, that was him. That's the one that was at first base. He's the one that caught all those outs. So that's Jerry Shire? When my son heard his name cross the lips of the opposing team members, <laughs> that head that had been hanging down, all of a sudden it popped back up again. <laughs> I watched my boy throw his shoulders back. I watched him get a little swag back in his step. In fact, we had to bring him down a few notches before the game started. It was amazing how completely different his countenance was, how much his countenance changed, not because the challenge went away, but just because he overheard what the enemy thought about him when he saw him coming. It's amazing how your countenance about your difficulties and challenges and mine will change, not because they go away, but because we overhear and really understand what the enemy thinks about us when he sees a daughter of God coming. Because when he sees you and he, when he sees me, he doesn't see us in our weakling power and fledgling strength. No, he sees the power of Almighty God that is on the inside of us. He sees the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us. And let me tell you something, even if you don't believe everything that the Word of God declares to be true about you, even if we're not sure about all this stuff, you need to know if you don't believe it, the enemy does. You might doubt it, but he doesn't. He knows that you have already been forgiven. He knows that there is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. He knows that he is already underneath your feet. He knows that he can form a weapon against you, but that, that weapon has no possibility of prospering in your life. He knows that according to 2 Corinthians, you've been made competent by the, for the task by the Holy Spirit of God. He knows that you have been given the victory. He knows that in the end, we win. <laughs> and I'm saying what a shame it would be for the enemy to believe more about our potential than we do. What a shame it would be for him to be able to just sprawl out a little difficulty and challenge in your life and just the sight of it is enough to keep you and me from rising up, stepping up to the plate of being who God has called us to be. He just scares us out of uh, reaching our full potential. Enough intimidation and fear will keep us paralyzed and insecure and not rising up to be the daughters of God. And I know that in a group this size, there are some challenges sprawled out in front of you. There are not many of us probably that are in this room that can raise our hand and say that we don't have some challenges right now in our life because all of us in this room are probably in one, in, one of, in one of three places. We're either right smack dab in the middle of challenge, you're on your way into a challenge, or you're on your way out of one. Because that's just the nature of the world in which we live. Jesus said it, John 16, 33, he said, in this world, you will have trouble coming. It's, it's a part of the world in which we live. And if for some reason you happen to be sitting in here tonight and you don't have any particular struggles, we just want to say we're happy for you. <laughs> but for the rest of us who live in the real world, <laughs> the Apostle Paul wrote some serious words for anybody interested in victory. His words are written in the book of Ephesians. As you turn there to the book of Ephesians, let me just tell you that scholars say of all of Paul's writing, the book of Ephesians is like the cream of the crop. I love the book of Ephesians. It's like the cherry on top of the cake. You know, a lot of the Apostle Paul's letters, a lot of those letters that he wrote to first century believers in provinces uh, during that day and age, he wrote letter after letter to disciple them and mature them. They didn't know what it meant to be a part of this new race of people, no longer Jew and Gentile separated, that they were now brought together under the umbrella of Christ's blood shed on Calvary. They were a new race of people. They didn't know what that meant. So he wrote them letters to help them to understand this new family of God. 
And of all of those letters that would become the New Testament, scholars say the cream of the crop of all of Paul's letters is Ephesians. Because in the book of Ephesians, he spends more than the first half of the book just rehearsing who you are. He spends one chapter and then another and then another just making sure you know what is the hope of his calling and choosing you. He wants to make sure you know what is the lavishness of the mercy of God that has been bestowed upon everyone who places faith in Jesus Christ. He wants to make sure you know that even if you've been rejected by everybody else, mother and father, sister or brother, best friend or spouse has walked away from you, that you have been hand-picked, hand-selected, adopted by the Most High King. He wants you to know that there is no pit of sin that you've gotten yourself into. You know, most of the stuff we're in, most of the, 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 the pits we're in, it ain't the devil, it's us. Really. A lot of it, y'all, we do to ourselves. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. The Apostle Paul says, I want you to know there is no pit you've dug for your own self. That the mercy of God is not so great and so grand that he can't reach down in that pit and snatch you up out of that pit. He wants you to know that you have been pulled out of darkness and flung into the marvelous light of God. In fact, Paul gets so beside himself, he bursts out in a prayer and he prays in the first chapter of Ephesians, I'm praying that the eyes of your heart would be opened. He says, because if they just be opened, he says, grace, you would see, you would see once and for all what is the hope of his calling and choosing you. He writes this incredible letter about who we are, about why we can step up to the plate and have victory because of our relationship with Christ. And then he's trying to figure out how to close a letter like this. How do I put an exclamation point on that letter so that the daughters of God in Memphis, Tennessee at the Zoe Conference will step up to the plate? So that when they go back home and the challenge is still just right there in their face, they won't shrink back in fear and insecurity, but that they'll go ahead and rise up to the mandate of chapters one through three. How do I put a period on this thing? I want you to just imagine Paul. He was in a Roman prison, probably house arrest when he wrote this letter. Imagine him hanging over the parchment paper with his ink quill in hand trying to figure out the words to say to make sure that we never succumb to the schemes of the enemy. I want you to picture the beads of sweat on his brow as the Holy Spirit begins to inspire him to write these words in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes. Somebody say schemes. The schemes of the devil. He says in verse 12, our struggle, it is not against flesh and blood, but it is against rulers and against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness that are in the heavenly places. He says, so therefore, in verse 13, you might as well go ahead and put down all the weapons of this world that haven't been working for you anyway, and take up some weapons that actually have some power. Take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, he says you ought to just go ahead and stand firm, therefore. The Apostle Paul puts a period on his letter to us, an exclamation point on his letter to us by introducing to us a concept that has never been this clearly articulated in Scripture. There are other places in the Old and New Testament from which we can infer the topic. But this is the first time a writer comes right out in big, big bold letters and says, you have an enemy. And your enemy is not the person you're sitting next to tonight. Somebody needs to hear that your husband is not your real enemy. <laughs> Somebody needs to know that your boss, your boss is not your real enemy. Somebody needs to be told tonight that your coworker, you know that one, that one that if she says one more thing to you, you go knock her out, that one. <laughs> the Apostle Paul came to tell you tonight through the Holy Spirit that your real enemy is no one or nothing that is flesh and blood, tangible and touchable.
invisible, physical, anything you can see is not your real enemy. The Apostle Paul comes right out to say, you have an enemy, an invisible, unseen enemy who is hoping that just because he's invisible, you will also think he is fictional. The Apostle Paul brings up the topic of spiritual warfare. He says you have an unseen enemy behind many of those challenges that are sprawled out in front of your life. Uh, behind many of them is an influencer, someone who is stirring the pot in hopes that you will be so intimidated and insecure you'll never rise up to be the daughter that God has called you to be and claim the victory that is already rightfully yours. It's his scheme, it's his sinister attack against your life to just compel you to shrink back in fear and insecurity and never become who God has called you to be. You've got this unseen enemy. He's preying on the fact, y'all, he's preying on the fact that he hopes we will forget he's there. This is what he does. He shifts the attention cleverly, stage left, so that you'll forget he's the one off to the stage right, pulling the strings of much of what is happening in our life. He so disguises himself behind life's most pressing problems in hopes that if he decides, disguises himself cleverly enough, you will forget he's the one behind the scenes because then he knows you will direct all the wrong weapons at the wrong culprit. He knows you'll think your words will work and your money will work and your solutions will work and your rationale will work, your connections will work. He knows that we will use earthly weapons and they will only accomplish earthly natural results as long as we forget that there's a real enemy. Oh, y'all, if we can get this in our minds, in our hearts, that when we go home tonight, tomorrow, and we look that problem dead in the face, the bills that are still there, the health concerns that we have, the trouble on our job, the struggle and friction in our relationships. If we will go home and see them from a spiritual vantage point, we will stop using the weapons we've been using to fight that problem. When Jude was younger, Actually, all three of the boys, but particularly Jude, I would take him um, to this harvest festival at a church around the corner from our house, a really small church. It was, it's like their answer to Halloween. They have a harvest festival, and it's a trunk or treat. Does anybody know what I mean when I say trunk or treat? Okay, lots of you do. Some of you may not. A trunk or treat is when members of the congregation volunteer to bring their cars into the parking lot on harvest festival night they open up the trunk of their car kids line up one trunk after the other to play a carnival or fair like game that's been created in the trunk of the car most of the time whether the kid wins or loses the game the person that owns that car gives them a whole bunch of candy and sends them home we are so grateful so we just go one car after the other it's like a big carnival and you just go from one car to the other and a few years ago the game everybody wanted to play was behind the bed of a truck. It was so cool because it was the only truck in the parking lot, so that was the longest line. We were standing in this long line. I was holding Jude's hand. He must have been about four at the time. He's almost nine now. I'm holding his hand, and we're standing in the line. It was really clever. They placed a, a, um, a few stairs right at the edge of the bed of the truck so that a kid could walk up into the bed of the truck. They gave the kid a huge plastic mallet and then they had attached a tabletop, a huge tabletop about the same size as the bed of the truck. They'd attached it to the side of the truck, cut six holes in the tabletop, draped it with fabric, and out from those holes, every few seconds, a puppet would pop through. So the job of the kid was run up and down the bed of the truck to pop the puppets on top of the head. It was a homemade whack-a-mole game. That's what it was, homemade whack-a-mole. So we're standing there waiting our turn. There was a kid behind us, y'all, that had us laughing hysterically, because he was very frustrated with this whole situation. <laughs> and he was very verbal about his frustration. First of all, mother, I do not understand why I'm standing in this line. Didn't I come to the carnival to have fun? It's not fun to stand in line. I have an idea, mom. How about I go over there and play those games while you stand in line and hold our space? <laughs> and then when you get up to the front of the line, I'll come back and join you. But he was not only verbal about his frustration regarding the line, but he was also very frustrated because, Mom, I don't even understand this game. Why in the world would I spend all my energy popping those puppets on the head if every time I see one of those kids hit the puppet on the head, the puppet disappears for just a few seconds because then the puppet comes right back? What is the point of this game if I'm going to hit the puppet on the head but the puppet's going to come back? He 
worked himself into such a frenzy that before any of us could see straight, out of our peripheral vision, we just saw a, a, a little kid running past us as he ran toward uh, the, the whole game. He grabbed the fabric and pulled it clean off the top <laughs> of the board. Underneath, there were three adults with puppets on each hand. We got a good laugh and we also got a good lesson that there is always something you can't see influencing what you can. And if you spend, if I spend all of my time and all of my attention and all of my natural weapons trying to smack at everything that keeps showing up in my life, at best, I will achieve temporary results. And I will exhaust myself in the process without having actually accomplished anything that will be lasting in my life. The Apostle Paul says, today is the day to pull back the curtain and let the enemy know we got our eye on you. To pull back the curtain, y'all, and use some weapons that actually work back there behind the curtain. He says, I want you to know the tactics of the enemy are so sinister against you. He doesn't have this blanket approach. Of course, he can in regards to larger entities like nations or churches or communities. He can, but he's very specific in his targets against you. The Apostle Paul wants to make sure you know that because he uses a specific word to describe the enemy's warfare in our lives. He says, he is scheming. Somebody say schemes. I want to tell you something about myself. Um, I am a fairly easygoing personality. I think that people that know me would, would agree to that, that I'm fairly easygoing. I'm not um, wound up very easily in terms of anger. It's just, I'm, I'm made like my dad in that way. We're just easygoing. So if someone offends me or hurts my feelings or whatever, and then they ask for forgiveness, I'm gonna forgive them really quickly and easily. I probably don't even know that they offended me. It just stuff rolls off of me really easy, easily. I'm kind of wired that way. So if somebody does me wrong, I can get over it. But if I find out someone was planning to do me wrong, well, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> Don't get it twisted. I'll take these earrings off and we, we can. Don't let, let the little white shirt fool you. If I find out somebody's been scheming, that's different. I find out you've been thinking beforehand. You've been studying me so that you can watch to see when I come and when I go. You've been watching to see what my weaknesses are so that you could figure out how to dangle the right carrots at the right time to lead me astray in the right way. You've been trying to figure out what my weaknesses are, what the proclivities of my flesh are so that you can take advantage of those. And not only have you been watching and studying me in my current state, you've been looking into my history so that you can figure out what abuses I've suffered, what uh, hurts I have so that you can figure out what tender places I might still have in my heart so that you could take advantage of those. And when I find out, not only have you had the nerve to be studying me, but you've been studying this man that the Lord has given me to be married to for the past 18 years, you are studying him to figure out what his weaknesses are so that you can try to lead him astray in the right way. You've been trying to figure out what the frailties of his flesh are and what he's inclined towards so that you can lead him away from our family and from our home and from the God-given destiny that he's been called to. And then when I find out, not only have you been studying him in his current state, but you've been looking into his history so that you can figure out what hot button issues he has from his history so that you can make his history and my history combust so that we cannot have peace in the four walls of our home. And then when I find out that not only have you been studying me and my husband, but you've had the nerve to have your eyes on these three boys that the Lord has given me to rear into men of God 
When I figure out you've had your eyes already set on their fears, their anxieties, their weaknesses, you're already planning at this fledgling stage how you can trip them up so that they do not rise up and become the men of God that they have been called to be. When I find out that you've been scheming against me and the people I love, well, if it's a war you want, it's a war you go have. doesn't it? It should cause a holy indignation to rise up on the inside of you. It should, it should compel you that if he's scheming against you, that you ought to have a scheme against him. Y'all, we got to have a plan of action. Listen to me. He is praying on lazy Christianity. He is hoping we will come to church on Sunday and say amen and come to the conference and applaud and have a great time. What he does not want is someone who rises up on Monday through Saturday and stands in the guest, the gatekeeper of her home. He wants us lazy and indifferent and apathetic, not picking up the armor of God and standing firm against his schemes. He doesn't care if you say amen to the message. He wants to make sure you don't go home and live the thing day after day. Somebody's gotta rise up and say, not today, devil, not on my watch. I'm not just gonna lay down and let you run roughshod over my family, my peace of mind. I gotta go to war. Y'all, we gotta go to war. We gotta go to battle against the schemes of the enemy. If your marriage is falling apart, it's your time. Rise up and be a woman of God. If your teenager is going astray, don't just lay back and watch the enemy take your son or your daughter on a ride. You be the one that is found on her knees with her hands outstretched, warring for her family. Grandmother, grandfather, we need you to go to war for your grandkids. The enemy wants you apathetic, he wants you lazy because then he can take advantage of you. And he's scheming, he's scheming. Have you ever wondered why that particular carrot is dangled in front of you? It's that temptation that wouldn't bug your girlfriend because it's not her thing. She's not even interested in that. It's the one that suits your fancy. Has it ever occurred to you that that carrot is always dangled when you're particularly lonely? That that carrot seems to show up when you're overwhelmingly tired. That it always seems to be right there when you're overwhelmingly hungry, vulnerable, easily enticed. That's not coincidence, that's a scheme. And he has schemes against nations, he has schemes against communities, he has schemes against churches, and he has a scheme against you. The Apostle Paul says, don't be afraid, but you better be on your guard. You gird yourself with some armor that works. I don't have, I don't have time to go through all the pieces of armor, but I do want to tell you about one. In the last five minutes and 30 seconds that I have with you, there's one. <laughs> one I can't let get away. The Apostle Paul says you need a breastplate because you've got to have something that blocks the enemy from a full frontal attack. You need something to cover and guard the most vital spiritual organ that you have, your heart. Just like your physical heart 
pumps all of the energy and life you need in order for you to continue to function in your physical body. Without the continued lifeline and function and health of the heart, you would not be able to survive physically. So it is that your spiritual heart is the lifeline for your spiritual well-being. All the fervency, the fire, the passion you need to have a prayer life that is not just talking to a random person without feeling the fire and passion of God. All of the fervor you need to follow God fully and to be on his assignment for your life with some sort of fervor in your footsteps and passion in your heart. The fire and the fervor that you need to open up the Bible and it not just be you reading some ink on a page, but to actually hear the voice of God speaking to you through the scriptures. All of that is tied to the health of your spiritual heart. So if I were your enemy, Ooh, I'd be after your heart. More than all else, listen to me, young people, more than all else, I'd want you not to have a breastplate on because I'd be after your heart. The Apostle Paul says, your breastplate is righteousness. Somebody say righteousness. righteousness. Jerry and I live in a fairly rural part of Dallas. We planned it that way, we like it. We're close enough to get there quick, far enough away to feel like we're worlds away. Quiet little two-lane road, horses are over there on somebody's land, there's some cows over there on somebody's land. We moved there because there was a yard, there was a backyard with trees and bugs and mud and things boys need in their lives. Because I'm that kind of mama that says, boy, go outside. Are there any mothers in the house that still believe in outside? Anytime they come to me and have the nerve to tell me they are bored, I say, you see that tree right there? Go play with it. You can eat it, you can play tag with it. I don't care what you do with it, go play. One of the things we love is that my, one of my closest friends lives across the street. She has for 10 years. She has a pond in the front of her property. So I grabbed the two fishing poles I bought on sale at the local super Walmart. I got a tackle box on sale at the lo- local super Walmart. We have some extra bobbers in the tackle box. We always lose those little bobber bobble thingies. Got extra hooks because we might need a couple extra hooks. And I've got some scissors in there just in case we need scissors. And I have gloves in the tackle box because y'all know Y'all know I don't mind going fishing, but I ain't finna actually touch no fish. (laughs) We grab whatever hot dog meat is left from the week. That's our our bait, because you know we're professionals. (laughs) We walk across the street, we stand on the, the edge, and we just fish right there on the edge. We catch little sun perch, no big deal. In an hour, we can catch like 10 fish because they're just all right there. So we'll just fish. It's like an easy, quick outing with me and the boys. But every now and then, every now and then, Leslie, I'm feeling adventurous, and there's a boat there. My neighbors have this boat. They got this metal rowboat on Craigslist. They leave it upside down so that it will drain water when it needs to, so that you know, if it were to rain, it wouldn't collect all the water. They leave it upside down. And when any of the neighbors want to take it out, we just turn it over, we push it out, We can row out a little bit to the middle of the pond and fish from there. So whenever I'm feeling adventurous, I'll say, come on, boys, let's take the boat out. That doesn't happen often, though, because in order to get in this boat, (laughs) i got to turn it over. (laughs) And I already know that the environment that has been created underneath this upside-down boat It's moist in there, it's dark, it's damp, it's shaded, it's perfect for a critter. So I know when I turn it over, I know something's gonna hop out from underneath it. I know something's gonna waddle out from underneath it or worst of all, some... Y'all are my people, y'all know. But every now and then I'm adventurous. I say, come on, boys, let's do it. I let them get the sides of the boat. I stand way back at the edge. We turn it over, inevitably something comes out. It's always amazing to me that never once have I had to write a golden sealed invitation, send it into the brush nearby to let the critters know, we'll be here at one o'clock today, you're invited to come and join us. 
Never once have I had to stand in that little portion of the, the shore there where we like to stand. Never once have I had to stand there and call into the brush on the other side of the pond to say, hey, we're here, come on, come, come be a part of our party. Never once have I had to invite the critters. Why? Because the environment created by the upside down boat is invitation enough. Righteousness is right side up living that invites the sunlight of God's favor and his grace on your life. Unrighteousness, are you listening? Unrighteousness is upside down behavior to where you don't have to invite the enemy to come and make himself at home. The environment that unrighteousness creates is the invitation. It creates the environment where demonic influence will flourish in your relationships, in your mind, in your heart, in your home, on your job, in your finances, in your health. Listen, you can be in your war room praying against the devil till you are blue in the face. But if you come out of that prayer closet and live a raggedy, wayward, unrighteous life, the enemy will still be on the way. The reason why he dangles the carrot in front of your life is because he wants you to follow that carrot down a path of unrighteousness because as soon as you follow him down that path, the boat has been flipped over and the environment he needs for demonic activity to flourish in your life has been made in your existence whether it's in your actions, whether it's in your attitudes, in any place, you have dug your heels into the ground and you refuse to walk in a way that is honoring God. Righteousness does not mean perfection. It means as a lifestyle, you have chosen to honor God to the best of your abilities to align your behavior with the truth that you say you affirm. Y'all, this is what the old school preachers Old school, back in our grandmama's day, great grandmama's day, the preachers didn't have um, any sort of fear to be political, co politically correct. They weren't interested in that. They just called it what it was. They said, listen, be ye holy. They called it holiness. That's what it is. Holiness keeps a breastplate fitted on your life. It staves the enemy off to where he's trying to figure out how he can get in and mess with your heart and your mind and your marriage and your relationships and your finances, but you've got such a big barrier of armor on the, on the front side of you. He can't figure out how to get in, which is why if he's leading you astray in some area of your life, if you're living, if I'm living in a way that is out of alignment with the truth of God, if right now the Holy Spirit's burning on the inside of you because you know you are walking in a way that is outside of alignment with the truth of God, that's his way of saying your breastplate is off, girl. It's time to put it back on because the enemy wants to take advantage of you. Do we have a few more minutes, Leslie? Am I okay? Listen. Listen, in this pre-seeker, seeker-sensitive era where we want everybody to feel comfortable and welcome, yes, come as you are, but don't stay as you are. And I'm afraid that we are in this generation, I'm including myself, y'all, I'm afraid that we're impressive, but we have on no breastplate. I'm afraid, young people, listen to me. I'm afraid that we have a whole lot of Instagram followers, but no breastplate. I'm afraid that the enemy is satisfied 
with how much applause we're getting from people because our selfies are perfectly lit. But then he's ripping us to shreds because we have no protection. I'm afraid that we have sacrificed holiness because we want to be impressive to other people and so we have a likeness of holiness. But we're not actually living right. And so if you are under the sound of my voice and you know you are living in a way that dishonors God, whether in your actions or in your attitudes, you have dug your heels into the ground and you have refused to turn to repent means not to say you're sorry, but by the power of God's spirit to turn and go a different way. If you have not made that choice, I want to invite you to make that choice tonight so that you can walk out of here with a breastplate on. Yeah. My grandmother went to see Jesus a couple years ago. She said, Priscilla, when I see him, I don't want to see him and meet him with my head hung down. I want to be able to look him in his eyes. She said he paid much too high a price for me to live any old kind of way. I don't want to meet him with my head hung down. When I see him face to face, he's not going to ask me about the stuff most people ask me about. He's not going to ask me about that movie. He's not going to ask me how many people read these books. He's not going to ask me how many people followed me or applauded me or knew my name. going to ask me if I knew Jesus. And then I'm going to give an account as to whether or not I squandered this gift or whether I walked in a manner worthy of the call. I want to live holy. And I know you do too. So if you're in this room and you're not living holy, you're just not, you know you're not, you, you, you're, you're living with him, you are sleeping with him, you are smoking that substance, you're addicted, you're drinking that alcohol, you're addicted. You are bound by every sin and hindrance. And to be honest, you don't want to, you don't want to change. You're happy where you are living in the squander. The good thing about the Holy Spirit, y'all, I've seen it proof for myself, is that he has a way to make you want to do the stuff you don't want to do. He doesn't just free you. He changes your want to. want to do right and then he can give you the power so that you can do right if you've refused to forgive he can make you able if you've been comfortable in your bitterness he can help to soften that place in your heart so that you can be healthy and whole and free in Jesus' name. 
if in attitude or action you know you've been walking the wrong way, so you know you don't have a breastplate on and you're watching the enemy just run rampant in your life because you have on no breastplate, but you want to get that thing on tonight. Come down here and meet with me right now at this altar. We're going to pray together once and for all. We're going to walk out of here with some victory. If that's you and you need prayer for that, come forward. stay standing or on your knees, whatever, whatever works for you. Just come as close as you can, okay? There's lots of room on this side as well over here and on that end. precious moment, Lord, that your spirit would come and set people free. Lord, I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit will do what they are admitting they cannot do in their own power. I'm asking right now, supernaturally, miraculously, would you break chains off of people's lives? Father, I'm asking you in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus Christ, that for the one caught in addiction, I am asking you, Father, for the taste for the drug to leave somebody's mouth right now in Jesus' name. I'm asking you, Father, for the taste for the alcohol to leave somebody's mouth in Jesus' name. Lord, I'm asking you that the illegitimate tie emotionally that this woman has to that man, I'm asking you to break that tie in Jesus' name. For the woman caught in an adulterous affair, Lord, I'm asking you would break that emotional, physical tie right now in Jesus' name. Lord, the next time she goes back to him, help her to not want to do what you don't want her to do any longer, Father. 
Lord, I am asking you for the bitterness to melt off of somebody's heart. The one that you have called to forgive and she's refused to forgive. Father, I'm asking today you would set her free. Help her to walk in forgiveness and to extend grace to that other person, Father. Lord, I'm praying for the wife that has dug her heels into the ground. She is resentful against her spouse and she will not follow in humility. I pray that you would give her a submissive spirit right now in Jesus' name to honor her husband as he honors you. Righteousness. Righteousness. We're going to live right, Lord. Not by our strength. We're going to live by, right by your power, your spirit. I thank you for your spirit. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would become a reality in the lives of all of these women. In my life, Lord, help us to no longer lean on the flesh, Lord, and to walk according to the flesh. Show us what it means to walk according to the spirit so that we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. And Father, as we honor you by living righteously according to your spirit, I pray that the breastplate would so defend us against the schemes of the enemy, Lord, that he cannot infiltrate our lives. So Father, I pray against every demonic attack of the enemy, against these women, against their husbands, against their children, against their finances, against their peace of mind, against their peace of heart. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name, that every attack of the enemy would be canceled in Jesus' name and by his blood that has been shed on Calvary. Break it right now in Jesus. Break the chains right now in Jesus' name. I pray for strongholds to crumble at the name of Jesus. I pray for any demons to tremble at the name of Jesus because it is at his name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So depression is bending the knee right now in Jesus' name. Unforgiveness is bending the knee right now in Jesus' name. Addiction is bending the knee right now in Jesus' name. Sickness is bending the knee right now in Jesus' name. We're gonna leave free tonight, Jesus. Healed and whole in Jesus' name. Everybody look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm gonna ask you a question. Have you placed faith in Jesus Christ? Listen to me, I'm not asking you if you have been in church all your life, if you've been in the choir, if you've done good things. I wanna know because victory is only ours in Jesus if we have a relationship with him, okay? So I can pray for you, we can, we can wanna walk in righteousness, but if you've gotta walk in righteousness in your own strength, that's gonna last about a week, then you're gonna be tired. You gotta have the Holy Spirit to help you to walk in righteousness, okay? You can't, I can't do it on my own and neither can you, okay? So in whatever area right now you need to break free and walk in holiness, you cannot do it without the Spirit. You receive the Spirit when you receive Jesus Christ, okay? It is a gift of your salvation. It's the best gift you'll ever get because the Holy Spirit comes bearing fruit. He comes bearing gifts. He comes in like a flood and He changes your life. He gives you power to do this stuff, okay? So I'm asking you, I'm asking you, can the lights come up a little bit? Because I need to see you. I'm asking you, have you placed faith in Jesus, okay? If you're right here, in the aisles, wherever you are, y'all, wherever you are, if you've never placed faith in Jesus, but you wanna seal that thing up tonight so you can get this breastplate on, okay? Just wave your hand at me if that's a prayer you need to pray tonight. You've never placed faith in Jesus Christ and you wanna do it tonight. If that's a decision you need to make, okay? In the balcony, anybody? You need to place faith in Jesus tonight. We're gonna take care of this tonight. We're gonna get some breastplates on up in here. I see you, I see you, okay. Keep your hand up if that was you. Y'all, sisters, can you look around if there's somebody near you with their hand raised, just reach over and put your hand on their shoulder 
grab their hand. Just let them know they're not alone in this moment. Look around you in the balcony. Come on, y'all. We're going to pray the prayer of faith. The Bible says you believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you shall be saved. Okay? We're going to all pray this together so that we can build an atmosphere of faith for those who are praying it for the very first time. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And I believe that you are that Savior. So today, I place faith alone in Christ alone to remove my sin. Take up residence in me in the person of the Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, say amen. Listen, I want to say one more thing and then we're going to sing like wild women. Listen, so you remember in The Lion King? It's all these hyenas messing with Simba. And Simba's like, Wah. and the hyenas are like, he tries again. Wah. And they're like, are you serious? We're not afraid of that puny weakling stuff you got going on. You can't do anything to us. He tries again. <laughs> Nothing. He tries one more time. And this time when he opens up his mouth, a roar comes out of nowhere that he can't imagine. And it's because Mufasa has shown up behind him and all of his roar is now connected to his son's roar. I came to tell somebody the enemy is going to be running away, not because of your roar, but because the Father's roar is now coming up alongside of you. And there's victory. There's victory in Jesus' name. Come on, y'all.